Okay, thank you. Okay, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Um, I have extra notes for the information for today and all my notes have been written wrong. <laughs> so so if, you, if you paid attention to the screens when we started, then you know the right date, the right information. But on the back of your bulletin, is the information. Today at 5.30, there'll be a group of folks in the sanctuary that are gonna work together to figure out how we're gonna decorate for Christmas. And if, you, and if you'd like to be part of that, you're invited, encouraged, and welcome to be here, 5.30, okay? Just bring your ideas and be willing to be flexible and think outside the box. And there may or may not be food. It's still <laughs> under discussion. So if you come hungry and there's not food, it won't take very long, okay? Okay, the other thing, as you can see, we have the Christmas child boxes for blessing them today. If you forgot yours at home, you can still get it here, bring it at 5.30. And we can bless it in absentia. Um, in addition to that, next Sunday, that's our exciting day. We're changing our service for one day. We're gonna meet at 10 o'clock. We're gonna meet with those early people who come at nine. They're gonna come at 10 also. We're gonna have a sample of how it will feel in five years when we've added 500 people to our family. Okay, this is a good time to practice. Now, you will need a ticket for the luncheon afterwards. It's Thanksgiving luncheon. You can also sign up with what your favorite dish to bring is. The sign-up sheets are in the cafe. There are no tickets in the cafe, but there are still tickets available. You're just going to have to work a little bit harder and come to the office during the week and get them from Linda. We have plenty of seats. We have plenty of tables. We just want you to have a ticket so we know we have a chair for you, okay? It's absolutely free. Bring a dish that's your favorite with your family. My family wants scallop corn. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Please come and join us. Come for 10 o'clock. Let's practice having a, a fun time together. And I will tell you, we've invited some more people We've invited some people from Wabasso. We are going to have interesting music. We are going to have traditional music. We are going to have lots of new friends. So let's join together and celebrate for Thanksgiving. Okay? No questions. I'm going to see you all in the mix of all those other people, right? Okay. Now, I don't have a job next week, so I'm just going to greet you at the door. I'm not, not going to be up here. So if you would all stand, no, standing? You got a video. I do. You want it now? Yes, I do. Okay, I'm gonna sit down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's just trying to get me to laugh because she know how much it hurts. <coughs> My goodness. Well, I'm not getting in anybody's space this week because I do have something. It's not COVID, I tested negative last night but it is certainly respiratory. Um, you know, Veterans Day was when? Friday. It certainly seemed like it got lost this year, didn't it? Yeah. It did, because of the storm, Nicole, you know, we seemed to get the brunt of it, but uh, thank God it wasn't an Ian, right? Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you what, uh, I've got a video that I want to show. We're going to do our, honoring our veterans a little different this year. Uh, I'm going to have you all stand and I want you to say the branch of the service you served in and remain standing. Veterans, you got, you got your assignment? All right, so I'll start. I never ask him I'd go anywhere I won't go. Uh, I'm Jerry. I served six years in the Air Force. Go ahead. We'll go right down the road. John and the Navy. John and the Navy. Stay standing.
All right, Gary, U.S. Marine Corps. All right. Another Marine. All right, Rick. Lloyd? Army. Army. All right. Are all the Navy. Give me your first name again. I Terry. Terry. All right. Any other veterans? All right. Hold your applause. Stay standing. Let's watch this video. And there's a point in the video where it says, we stand with our veterans. I'd like everybody to stand at that time. Are we ready? Let's watch our video. Thank each of you and your families for your sacrifice and service. Please be seated. You know, no, I'm not done. I'm not done. I should have a little token where I can hand it to her. Uh, what I was going to say, <laughs> you're doing it again. <coughs> this hurts. Um, is uh, years ago at uh, Trinity in Sarasota, uh, I had the privilege of meeting and becoming best friends with a guy named Hawk Eskew. Uh, and Hawk flew many missions in uh, Korea and in Vietnam. He was an ace. Um, I tried for years to get him to come to a moment like this on Veterans Day, and he never would. And then finally, uh, he was wheelchair bound by this point in time and towards the end of his life, he said, Jerry, I'll do it. By then I'd stopped asking and I said, do what? <laughs> he says, I'll come. And uh, he showed up, uh, his wife Ross pushed him in a wheelchair and he was in his dress blues. He was a striking figure, he really was. You're the man who couldn't stand up anymore, uh, but he could still salute. And he took the microphone and he said something like this. Jerry, I'm not a hero. The heroes didn't come home. And that's true. Each of us is called to be heroic. That doesn't mean that we have to sacrifice all, but it means we sacrifice some. And so for you men and women, some of you are boys and girls that set aside your calendar, your summers, set aside your agenda, maybe delayed college or stayed in college to delay entry onto active duty. But whoever you are and for whatever you did, you've made a difference. And that's exactly what a hero does. And I tried to explain that to Hawk, but he always shook it off. <laughs> Don't shake it off. Don't be one of those veterans that you wonder how a 20-year-old could have served in Vietnam. Don't be one of those. But at the same time, be proud of who you are. Whether you serve for two years or 20 years or 60 years. It may have felt like 60, right, John? Just be proud of who you are and what you did. You made a difference. And so you have stood on the wall of freedom. And kids today are standing on that wall right now. Remember all the veterans, especially the young ones, because they're facing a world 
in some ways, very much like we faced in the 70s. In my uniform crossing Ohio State's campus, I was called a baby killer. It was the last time I wore my uniform on campus. Our military, by and large, is held in much higher regard today. But most people don't realize that we are still on the front lines and people are still dying. It makes a difference because we stand for freedom, not just for Americans, but for those across this world that cannot stand for themselves. This is a heroic nation. And for those who question and doubt and cast dispersions, why are we the police force for the world? Let me remind you of Lady Liberty standing in the harbor arm held high, with these words, give me your tired, your poor, and your hungry. That promise is still there and the torch is still lit. Thank you for keeping it lit on your watch. And do all you can to encourage the young men and women today who have been past the torch of liberty. And do all you can to silence those who have never served and yet would cast aspersions on the freedoms that give them the right to say what they think, to feel what they feel, but don't give them the right to trample on this nation. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, if you'll stand one more time, we'll join together in the Apostles' Creed with one of our heroic comments of all the things we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right. If you remain standing, and let's join together in our opening hymn. America the Beautiful. Let us pray. 
Almighty Father, creator of mankind and author of peace, as we are ever mindful of the cost paid for liberty we possess, we ask you to bless the members of uh, the armed forces. Please give them courage, hope, and strength. May they ever experience your firm support, gentle love, and compassion and healing. Please be their power and protector, leading them from darkness to light. And as our veterans are protected by you, our church here at Roseland is also in need of your gentle hand, your peace and understanding in discerning the future of our church and world and our future. Please hear us when we pray as you taught us to pray. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. so beautiful. Thank you. You may be seated. Isn't it great having her live? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Mm -mm -mm. And I do apologize. My voice and my energy are both ready this morning. So 
Ah, uh, can we get the message splash up? Now, I know that you guys don't watch too many Marvel comic book uh, movies, do you? Oh, Marilyn. Marilyn's back there. Who's your favorite? Three grandsons. So which of your three grandsons is your favorite hero? Captain America. Oh, Captain America. Yeah, he's one of my favorites. Anybody else got another favorite? The Hulk. Anything mean and green, you're all about. I know, D. All right. Any others? Wonder Woman. Now you're talking. How about uh, anybody old school? Do you remember the black and white Supermans? What was his? Reeves was his name, right? Chris Reeves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, whoever your hero is, I just want to push through this six-week study in the book of Hebrews that Jesus is actually greater than all of these fictional as well as true heroes in our lives. You know, a hero is somebody who's admired or idealized for courage, outstanding uh, achievements, you know. Uh, Captain America saved the United States, right? No. Uh, or some other noble quality or qualities. Um, you sang this a minute ago. I put this in the slideshow because the first service didn't sing this, and you did. Um, this is my favorite stanza in the song we sang. Oh, beautiful for what? Heroes proved. A lot of people want to believe that we're heroic until that moment comes where we have to step up or step away. There's no sitting on the fence. We have this idealized self, the one who would be heroic in that conversation with your child or grandchild, your neighbor or coworker. Uh, and yet, when the moment comes, you either step up or you step away. Oh, beautiful for heroes proved. The world is going to prove the kind of stuff you're really made of. And here's what you need to hear if you failed a million times before. The Holy Spirit, assuming you're a Christ follower, will draw you back into another moment where you can stand in the power of Christ. So that's this idea of liberating strife, this idea that, you know, the things in life really worth possessing, the things in life that kind of crystallize what it means to be fully human, that moment where your compassion can be on display, that moment where your, your heart and your passion can truly make a difference, maybe just in one person's life, maybe in a hundred people's lives, but it's in that strife that liberation, maybe it's liberation from this false image that you or somebody else possesses where you're less than or they're less than, and suddenly they discover that they can do all things in Christ who gives them the strength they need. But there is a certain category of hero, despite what my friend Hawk Eskew said, where uh, you set aside your plans, you set aside your time, and in many ways, your treasure. I remember I had hired a young man straight out of the Navy. His dad is a pastor in the Florida Annual Conference, and he told me when he came looking for a job, his name was Nathan, his dad had called me and said, Nathan's going to come and ask you for a job as a praise leader, and I want you to know he's really good. I said, well, thanks for the heads up. He said, no, no. I want you to make sure, if you don't do anything else, that you never let him answer a call to full-time ministry. <laughs> I said, Mike, why is that? And he and I have a fun relationship, so there's just this dead silence on the other end. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and so the guy's got all the gifts and graces, but one, one of the things that he lacked at the time, this is 25 years ago, that he has now, he got it because he's the father of three precocious boys. He didn't have as much patience as always necessary inside of ministry. And so Mike had some wisdom and said, don't let him do that. Um, but we got in this discussion one day, and he just, I don't know, I told him what I made as an enlisted man in the Air Force back in 1978. And he just looked at me. He said, you're kidding. So well, what did you make? He'd just gotten out as like an E6 or something like that. And uh, he made like 10 or 12 times what I made. And so I like, can't believe it. I think you're wolfing me. So we went online. There's a website. You can look up by year and by rank, time and service. And we were both right. And so um, back in the 70s, they didn't make what they do today. 
But back in the 70s, I could buy six McDonald's hamburgers for a buck, okay? <laughs> and I try to do that today, right? So, but remember, they, there are still men and women serving on active duty that truly are. Uh, they're, uh, maybe they'll be like me and many of you, where it's a good place to start. It got me out of Hicksville. Woohoo! Yeah, baby! Nothing against Hicksville, if you're listening, friend. Uh, but uh, there is something about giving yourself to a cause greater than yourself. And even if it doesn't pay as well, teachers fall in this heroic line. Paramedics and firefighters and police fall into this heroic line. Uh, why would you uh, uh, strap on a badge and a gun every day and go out into this firefight that's called the culture today? How many of you would just love to sign up for that job? Right. But are you glad people have? Absolutely. You know, the old joke is true. Uh, a couple of guys are sitting in the squad car and Two calls come in simultaneously. One is for an armed bank robbery in progress. And the other one, the other one is for a domestic dispute. Which one do you suppose they take? The armed robbery. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we're involved in a domestic dispute in this country. And it's not just the generations, and it's not just the races. It's against ideologies. Uh, one thing that used to unify America was this ideology of freedom this ideology of uh, a place where we're not all the same, but we respect each other's differences. And I don't try to make your differences greater or less than mine. I just say, wow, what a cool heritage. Oh, you, you know my heritage. What are some of your heritage? Where did your people come from? Germany. Sprachen Sie Deutsch? Ja, sehr gut. Just a little bit? Okay. All right, how about some others? England. England? Let's see. Can you understand American? <laughs> how about others? Norway. Norway. I have no idea what to say. <laughs> Home of Santa Claus and the reindeer, right? All right. How about others? Poland. Poland. She's a quarter Polish. Explains how she got hooked up with me, huh? Polish are actually heroic people, if you don't know their real history, by the way. All right. Ireland, yeah! Home team, yeah. All right, but here's the deal. Just because I'm Irish or Scott, and just because you're German or English or uh, Welsh or Scandinavian, some of my best friends are from uh, the Soviet, former Soviet Union, the Ukraine, as well as Russia, um, we celebrate those differences. Anybody ever had real borscht? I had no idea beets could be that heavy. Oh my God. I, I was like, I won't go into the full details, but yeah, one bowl of that will fix you up for about a month, okay? <laughs> but, so, but we celebrate that. That's who we are as a country. That's who we are as a nation. We're, we're a, a melting pot, really more of a tossed salad, let's be honest, yeah, especially the first generations. Uh, they don't completely learn the culture, and they don't completely learn the language, uh, but by the second and third generations, we are becoming one. We are. And so each with each assimilation, America became slightly different. We became slightly better, or maybe slightly worse. But we became. So mercy more than life. If you don't understand the cause of freedom, if you don't understand the effect of mercy, then you will never truly live a life. You'll be afraid of the different. You'll be afraid of the other. You'll be afraid that what you have will be taken away. And so you will live from this mentality of scarcity. And yet God continues to bring abundance to this nation. And somehow this mentality of scarcity has taken hold of a people who have, for, since our beginning, have stood for freedom. Send me your tired, your poor, your what? Hungry. The torch of freedom is still above the bay. The doors of America still are open. We are a merciful nation. We are a grace-filled nation. We, the people need to remember who we are. 
May God, thy gold refined, has far more to do with our, our national character than it does with what's in the mint. Till all success be nobleness. Nobleness means you put aside our pettiness. We put aside our differences and we look to the top common good and every gain divine. You see, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. And yet, too many Christians think what he meant to say, blessed are you who pick up the sword and try to defend me. Now, I know for some of you, you say, well, Jerry, that doesn't sound like a Veterans Day reality. It's a strange way to interpret the second verse of my favorite song. But it's what I need you to hear as we begin to talk about, really, freedom. On the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, the fighting of World War I ended. Do you remember what they called World War I? No, that's what they called the day. But what did they call the war? Why did they hope that was true? Because of the millions of lives that were lost. In almost every nation on the earth, they lost their lives in trenches in horrible ways. The brutality of humanity was put on display to where not even the most naive, the most disconnected person wasn't affected by that war. The munitions they used in that world war were so powerful that some of those guns that they fired, when the shells landed, you could hear the explosion 140 miles away. We'd fire it here and they'd hear the shell land. They'd hear it in Jacksonville. We tore lives apart in increasingly gruesome and efficient ways. So when the war to end all wars was finally over, it ended in armistice. An armistice says that one of us can't fight anymore. So we're sort of like two dogs in the backyard. One of them eventually lays on its back and puts its legs up in the air, meaning I submit. Armistice Day was a great day because the fighting stopped. But you know what a greater day was? When the United Nations was eventually formed. But it would take more conflict and more disagreements that were handled disagreeably to get us there. In 1959, they renamed Armistice Day something else. What is it? Veterans Day. To honor all men and women, and really boys and girls, because let's face it, Back in the 70s, you couldn't buy a beer at 18, but you were given an M16 and told to go kill somebody in a country you never knew existed. See, inside of war, laws, the old poet says, laws become silent. But it's in war that the mercy of God and Jesus Christ must take a stand. You know, you may not realize it, but Christianity, from its very beginning, is a heroic faith. We are called to rise up when everything in us wants to stay seated, everything in us wants to retreat. You know, Christians, though, I want to give you this image. Christians are like salmon. What is the first image that comes to your mind of salmon? Swimming upstream. That's exactly who Christians are. And we have been from the very beginning. The stories contained in the Old and the New Testament that have become our legacy, our heritage, is about being salmon, swimming against the stream of a culture that seems hell-bent and bound to go into darkness and to stay in darkness as quickly as it can. We are called to, to swim against that cultural stream of darkness. We are called to be a force of hope. We are called to be a source of light in a darkened and darkening world. Are you willing to be a salmon? Are you going to keep going with the crowd? Are you going to be more of a lemming than a salmon? I'm going to challenge you in today's message to think salmon thoughts. Uh, Hebrews 10, I, for originally when I laid out the series and I knew this was going to be the weekend where we're going to do Veterans Day, I originally thought about doing Hebrews chapter 11. That's not going to be one of the chapters we look at in our six-week study. I chose chapter 10 because there was a time uh, 
10, chapter 10 is like a T. It sets up the shot that the author of Hebrews takes in 11, where he has the Hebrews Hall of Fame. But you need to understand the times they lived in and why he had to remind them of the heroes of the faith. Here's what they lived in. Read with me, would you? We're going to read this again at the end, and by the end, I hope you read it with a softer heart and a more open mind. Let's read. Remember, after you received the light. Now stop right there. What's the light? Jesus. After you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you endured what? What kind of a conflict do you endure when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Be realistic. Don't give me church answers. Give me real answers. Oh, there aren't. What's that? Satan. Satan. Yeah, personal attacks. Satan's not interested in attacking people that aren't in Christ, but he does take an interest. Uh, now, I don't read a you know a fourth level private in Satan's army, but uh, I, nonetheless, I do know that he uh, sets me up to trip myself up a lot. So. Um, have you ever had to sacrifice anything because you became a Christian? Did you lose some friends? Maybe some family members that just are not going to engage in conversations because you're a Jesus freak? Say, no, no, Jerry, that's not who I am. So, but in this day and age, these Hebrew Christians had received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and it created an immediate conflict in their reality a conflict with their family and friends, a conflict in their business acquaintances, and a conflict even with the powers that ruled Palestine, a little country called Rome. So they're enduring real conflict because they have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And he elucidates it for us right there. He says, you were publicly what? Insulted and persecuted, and you stood with those who were so treated. Have you ever felt publicly insulted or persecuted because you're a Christian? Have you ever felt that? Most Americans haven't. Some Americans have. Around the world, there are people who are giving their life because they will not recant the name of Jesus Christ. This isn't some historical oddity. This is a reality. Read the, uh, the Voice of the Martyrs. It's an interesting rag, but... The stories are people who are much like you and me. The difference is they're meeting in Peking instead of Sebastian. The difference is they are meeting in what are now Muslim-occupied countries that once were Christian. The world is changing. And in some places, the cause of Christ is moving forward. In other places, the cause of Christ is being pushed underground. And I'll leave for you, at least for right now, the question, on which of those sides is America? Is it easier or harder to be an evangelical Christian in America? Is it easier or harder to be an evangelical Christian inside of the denominational church? So you were publicly insulted and persecuted, and you stood with those who were so treated. Read the rest with me, would you? You suffered with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you had better and lasting possessions. Wait right there. Take out your keys. I'm going to send the offering plate around. (laughs) I don't want you to, to miss in that humorous thought this truth. Ultimately, who owns, if you're a Christ follower, ultimately who owns Your car. God. Ultimately, who owns, as a Christ follower, who owns your house? God. So um, if God gives you a nudge through the Spirit to go take somebody from here to there, uh, and you respond, well, God, it's your car, of course. You know, I'll be your chauffeur. Then you're on the side of these Hebrews. But if you say, why would I do that? then you're not yet fully sold out for Christ. Now, I want to make sure you understand this isn't Pollyannish. It really does work, and it sometimes creates conflict in marriage. For example, my own. (laughs) We were serving in Hudson, and there was a very sweet lady. Elena was her name. She was Hispanic. She didn't have a car. Her husband needed the truck for work. And Elena had three kids that were very active, and so she needed to go somewhere almost every day. And then one day she asked Lisa for a ride. 
And you know what Lisa said? She said, yes. So what do you suppose that did with all the requests after that? <laughs> For all practical purposes, Lisa became Elena's chauffeur. <laughs> and I got to admit, we had some conversations around this thing. And, you know, as long as it was her, it was easy for me to say, yeah, you're doing the right thing. But then when I started getting involved, <laughs> I wasn't so sure. But here's, here's the deal. If it really is God's, if you really do feel that God is asking you to do this with it, then why wouldn't you do it? Or your home. I remember it got worse than that. You know, it does. I just, I'm a wacko. Um, we're serving in Jacksonville, and we had a huge homeless issue there. We have a homeless issue here, but we would swallow over 12,000 homeless in the winter in Jacksonville because everybody comes to Florida. What, would you rather be sleeping on the streets in Chicago or somewhere in Florida? So they get to Jacksonville, they think they're in Florida. They're not. They're in southern Georgia, you know. And so, um, but we had a huge homeless population. And the first year I was there, I kept pushing the boundaries back further and further. And so Lisa came home one day and there was this homeless guy showering in our bathroom. <laughs> and when Lisa draws the line, you know it because her mouth gets that big. <laughs> And she says, what's he doing in my bathroom? And I said, well, it's a guest bathroom. It didn't matter. It was a guest bathroom. <laughs> so we finished with him and, and helped him get on his way. But that was the last time I let somebody use the bathroom. Uh, but if I cleared it with Lisa and felt compelled by God, I would. I'm not saying that's where you have to be. And I am saying you have to be as wise as serpents, but as gentle as doves. That's not my idea. It's Jesus' idea. But the problem I have today is most of us are satisfied with just being serpents. And what the world really needs are what? Doves, but not dumb doves, <laughs> smart doves. So if you put everything you have into perspective, including your own life, by the way, I, I feel lousy half for a couple of days, but more than a few times I'm like, you know, if there's something I can gain out of this, great. Otherwise, get me through it as quickly as possible. But it's your body. Do with it what you want. And I'm sure he's told me a couple of times, yeah, but you messed it up. It's on you. Don't put this on Jesus. Um, but we are going to have better and lasting possessions. You know, so whatever you're holding on to as tightly as you can, just remember, you're not going to take it with you. So as much joy as it uh, gave you, maybe earning the income to buy that prized possession and then buying it and then owning it and then showing it off and shinying it up and maybe taking it to the antique road show or something, whatever it was, there's so much more joy in sharing it. If you haven't tried that yet, try it and you'll see that I'm not quite as crazy as I sound. So it says remain confident. Confident in who? In Jesus, confident in this call of Christ. I'm not saying be, be crazy with your possessions. I'm saying put them all in the proper perspective. We are called to live a heroic life. And if you've never got out there where it feels a little oh, risky, then you've not yet experienced that brush of true reality. Uh, what would anybody choose to serve Christ to to set aside our plans, to set aside our freedom and, and do what somebody else wants us to do with them. Uh, let's go back to the military analogy. In the army, when a sergeant tells his private to jump, what's the only correct answer? To jump and on the way up, ask how high. Do you realize that that ultimately is the goal for Christians? So how do you take a guy off the street and turn him to, into a person who will ask how high as he's jumping. How do you do that? What's that 6, 8, 12, 16 week program called? Basic training. Basic training, boot camp. Well, here's an image that most of you have never had before. Sunday morning church is a boot camp. We're supposed to be taking God's word and then teaching you God's word and giving you practical applications to where you're no longer thinking that way, you're no longer feeling that way, you're no longer acting this way. If you, are, if you had joined the military and acted exactly the same way you did before, you know, the alarm rings, it's four o'clock, you're supposed to be getting up to go out on the drill pad and you say, Sarge, I need another 30 minutes. What's gonna happen? 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, you go to boot camp so that you can begin to challenge and change your thoughts, your feelings, your behaviors uh, for a greater cause. You know, in combat, self-centered behavior gets people killed. You may not realize it, but one of the reasons churches are dying, one of the reasons that people are going to hell in a handbasket and the church doesn't seem to care is because we're self-centered. We're not yet really, truly Christ-centered. And we have all kinds of programs uh, that allow us to act as if we're on board with Jesus, but we're not bringing anybody to him to save. You know, let's say a platoon needs to take an enemy position. So the sergeant says, Jim, take Bill and Pete with you and slip around the blind side of that hill. And Jim looks at the sergeant and says, no thanks, man. (laughs) That just seems a little dangerous to me. What would happen? What would happen? Yeah, it would be chargeable under the UCMJ, Uniform Code of Military Justice. Uh, But the hill wouldn't be taken, right? And there was a reason that hill needed to be taken. And so somebody else is going to have to be signed to do the job that was your job. Do you realize that happens inside of homes, inside of marriages, inside of businesses, inside of communities, nations? It happens inside of the church. Self-preservation is a powerful force. That's why there is a boot camp. That's how you can take a person off the street, and when they're given a command, they respond to the command. They don't question it. They, unless it's an illegitimate command, they don't question it. And they ask what the parameters are while they're responding. So that's why Paul writes in Romans 8, 7, or 5, 7, read it with me, would you? No one is likely to die for a good person, though someone might die, be willing to die for a person who is especially good. You know, that seems reasonable. We're more willing to, to, to go all in, to sacrifice for those that we love, aren't we? Aren't you willing to do more for your kids than for the neighbor's kids? especially the ones that run their radio at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Do you know the difference between the pig and the chicken at the breakfast table? (laughs) The chicken is willing to make a contribution. Here you go, four eggs over easy, right? Uh, And the pig, the pig, to be at the table, has to make a sacrifice. (laughs) So which are you when it comes to your faith? Are you... Bacon or egg? Are you a contributor or are you making a living sacrifice? Are you willing to lay it on the line for the cause of Christ? You know, the most influential and effective movement of humanity in the history of this planet has been Christianity. And yet for some reason, in the United States in the last hundred years, the cause of Christ has stumbled. It has not yet fallen, but it certainly has stumbled while we are busily engaged in things that have nothing to do with salvation. It's, you know, if you're fussing about the color of the carpet or uh, the kind of music or whatever, that's an egg issue. You know, you're contributing your opinion, and it's not a bacon issue. The bacon issue is how many people are finding a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. That when in, you don't show up at church on Sunday because you're showing up at the pearly gates and you see those 14 people you help personally lead to Christ. Are you bacon or are you egg? Um, how can Christianity be such a heroic faith? This is the reason. If you don't possess that kind of faith, you need to stew on this passage. This is what drove the readers, the hearers of Hebrews chapter 10 to be willing to sacrifice not just time, not just energy, not just possessions, but their freedom. They were in prison. And those who weren't in prison went to see those people in prison despite the fact that they were going to be criticized and maybe lose their livelihood. So Christianity is a heroic faith. The question is, are you bacon or egg? So God showed his great love, read it with me, would you, Romans 5, 8. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were yet sinners. So that is good news. 
So whether you've been faithful up to this point in your life or you've just been totally oblivious that Christianity is this heroic faith, God has always sent his son to sinners. God has always uh, sent his son to say, you know what? Now you're aware. You know what? Now you can feel the Spirit saying you must make a difference in that battered woman's life. You must make a difference in that shattered child's world. You must make a difference. Why? Because God made a difference in your life. He has showed you such great love. How can you think it's all about you? How can you turn such a beautiful love into something so ugly? Do you know the difference between uh, the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea? Yes, but here's why. One's alive and one's dead. One is a great source of food and pleasure, uh, but the rains fall and they go into the, to that, that uh, sea and then they go down the Jordan River to what other body of water? The Dead Sea. The Dead Sea takes it in. It's one of the lowest places on earth, by the way. It takes it in but never lets anything out. Do you know that's what happens to faith? If all you do is receive the blessings of God and uh, never share those blessings with others, if you think that God sent Jesus to die for you and that's all there is, then you're the Dead Sea. And that's not what God wants you to be. You're still dead in your sins and maybe starting to come alive in Christ. Christianity is meant to be heroic faith. You're meant to see, you're meant to hear, you're meant to go and do and make a difference. Maybe it's in one child's life. Maybe it's in one woman's life. Maybe it's in one homeless man's life. There are so many opportunities around us for us to step up and to step into authentic Christianity. How many of you know what ADD is? Attention Deficit Disorder. At least I think that's what it is. (laughs) Look, squirrel. Uh, uh, The church today is suffering from JDD. What is JDD? Jesus deficit disorder. You know, the name above all names is barely whispered while the church rants and raves about justice and social issues. If you step into the darkness, for God's sake, don't go without delight. Jesus Christ. He's the answer. It's not some program. It's, It's Jesus. Socrates said to his disciples, follow my teachings. Buddha said to his disciples, follow my meditations. Uh, Confucius, he said, follow my, uh, what was it, sayings, the sayings of Buddha. And then uh, Muhammad, Muhammad said, follow my five noble pillars. Jesus didn't say follow his teachings. What did he say to his disciples? Follow who? Me. It's about taking Jesus to people, not taking your ideas about Jesus to people. Um, As great as every religious, political, or personal hero is, Jesus is greater. And he's still falling on the grenade of sin in my life and in your life. He still has that great love for you and for them. And he is still calling you to stand up in a darkened and darkening world make a stand for him. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie with Kevin Sorbo, God is Not Dead. Have you seen that? I recommend you watch all of it. Watch this two-minute clip. Evil is atheism's most potent weapon against the Christian faith, and it is. After all, the very existence of evil begs the question, if God is all good and God is all powerful, why does he allow evil to exist? The answer at its core is remarkably simple. Free will. God allows evil to exist because of free will. From the Christian standpoint, God tolerates evil in this world on a temporary basis so that one day those who choose to love him freely will dwell with him in heaven, free from the influence of evil, but with their free will intact. In other words, God's intention concerning evil is to one day destroy it. Well, how convenient. One day, 
I will get rid of all the evil in the world. But until then, you just have to deal with all the wars and holocaust, tsunamis, poverty, starvation, and AIDS. Have a nice life. You can actually be lecturing us on moral absolutes. Well, why not? Professor Radisson, who's clearly an atheist, doesn't believe in moral absolutes. But his course syllabus says he plans to give us an exam during finals weeks. Now, I'm betting that if I manage to get an A in the exam by cheating, he'll suddenly start sounding like a Christian, insisting it's wrong to cheat, that I should have known that. And yet, what basis does he have? If, if my actions are calculated to help me succeed, then why shouldn't I perform them? For Christians, the fixed point of morality, what constitutes right and wrong, is a straight line that leads directly back to God. Oh, so you're saying that we need a God to be moral, that a moral atheist is an impossibility. No, but with no God, there's no real reason to be moral. I mean, there's not even a, a standard of what moral behavior is. For Christians, lying, cheating, stealing, in my example, stealing a great idea and earn are forbidden. It's a form of theft, but if God does not exist, as Dostoevsky famously pointed out, if God does not exist, then everything is permissible. We are living in that day and age now. The Bible talks of a time when every man did what was right in his own heart, and chaos ensued. They're living in a world that even if they're not going to say, we don't believe in God, they live as if there is no God. So do you think we still need a heroic faith? The answer is absolutely. It's heroic, obviously. Look at Jesus on the cross taking the bullet for humanity. But you have joined a combat unit when you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you've been a veteran for five days, five years, 50 years, do you hear the voice of your sergeant saying, take that hill? Not Calvary. He's done all the heavy work but he has work for you to do right here and right now. That's what the author of Hebrews chapter 10 was saying to the people suffering great persecution in their day, in their place. And that's what I'm saying to you, not just in this room, but to the church of Jesus Christ around this world. These words are just as true today as they were when they were written. Read them for me, would you? Remember after you had received the light, you endured a great conflict. You were publicly insulted and persecuted, and you stood with those who were so treated. You suffered with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you had better and lasting possessions. So remain confident. It will be richly rewarded. When you joined the army of Jesus Christ, your relationship with the world changes. And if it hasn't, you're still in the enlistment phase. Once you become a living sacrifice, you're bacon, not chicken. <laughs> but you're serving Christ. And that, and that alone, makes every sacrifice worthwhile in your home, in your school, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, and unfortunately today, even in your church. The truth is we need heroes. Heroes like Moses who didn't say, I don't do pharaohs or take long walks. We need heroes like Noah who didn't say, you know what, I don't do arcs, especially with animals. <laughs> we need people like Rahab who didn't say, I don't do enemy spies. Or Ruth who didn't say, you know, I don't do mother-in-laws. <laughs> we need heroes like David who didn't say, I don't do giants. We need heroes like Mary, who didn't say, I don't do virgin births. We need heroes like Paul, who didn't say, I don't do Gentiles. We need the hero, Jesus Christ, the one who didn't say to the Father, I don't do crosses. It's Veterans Day. Remember, if you have enlisted in God's army, there is a hill to take. Amen? Amen.
you would please rise for our closing song, which I have no idea. Make me a servant. How appropriate. Bless these in this service. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right. I'll remain standing. This won't take very long, but it is very meaningful. Imagine this package is going to go somewhere around the world. Uh, it used to be they always went to two-thirds world countries, and then after Katrina, they realized kids in, I don't know, the bayous of America needed hope as well. So this one is for a little girl, and it has toothbrushes. Who, which little girl doesn't want to get toothbrush on Christmas morning? <laughs> I love it. You know, actually, if your teeth are falling out, that's a great present. Uh, but it's also got a Barbie. Oh, which little girl wouldn't love to have a Barbie? <laughs> and there's clothes in there, and there's crayons. There's all kinds of really great stuff for a little girl. What I want you to do is I want you to imagine that sometime between now and Christmas, this is going to arrive with many other boxes, and it's going to be in the hands of a little girl or maybe a little boy, and they're going to open this up. And they're going to be excited for what they see. They're going to be excited for what they get. They're going to be excited to play, but they're also going to be given the story of Jesus. You see, the Franklin Graham organization, Samaritan Purse, isn't just about distributing toys. It's about sharing the love of Christ. And so you have chosen this year to participate in the sharing of that love. And so I would like everybody, whether you created a box or not, to lift one hand to heaven and one hand towards these boxes. And let's bless them together. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. For the excess blessing. To the excess blessing. In my life. In my life. To share with these children. To share with these children. Bless their heart. Bless, bless their heart. Bless, bless their soul. Bless their soul. And bless their play. Bless and bless their play. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And all God's kids said. Amen. 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 Thank you again for the Christmas spirit. Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit that you have shared this year. Uh, receive the blessing. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, realize that you are loved by God, that you have been saved into a heroic faith where no life has to be mundane, where every life that you run into is worth reaching out and touching with the love of God and Jesus Christ. I know it's risky. I know it's kind of cool. It's one of the coolest risky things you'll ever do. Some of the other risky things you've got to stop doing, okay? <laughs> Go forth in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit to be the source of light in someone's life this day. And all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. All right.